This is Garrett Chobi, and today we'll be discussing a surgical video for a case of a juvenile nasal angiofibroma, including a combined endoscopic and transmaxillary approach. This is a case with myself and my neurosurgical partner, Dr. Van Gumpel. As you can see on this coronal CT scan image, there's a right-sided nasal cavity mass uh, filling the majority of the nasal cavity, as well as extending uh, laterally towards the infratemporal fossa. In this still shot, you can see erosion and infiltration of bone over the middle cranial fossa, as well as destruction of the right pterygoid wedge and extension laterally in that particular region. In light of this, I would probably term this a UPMCD stage 3 tumor, as there is extension laterally in the infratemporal fossa, as well as erosion of the middle cranial fossa, but as you'll see in a moment, minimal vascularity after embolization. Here's a corresponding axial MRI scan showing the high degree of vascularity as well as lateral extension along the middle cranial fossa and laterally through the pterygopalatin fossa into the infratemporal fossa. Based on the high degree of suspicion this was a JNA, uh, we did obtain angiography prior to surgery. As you can see here, that's the pre-op angiography demonstrating a high degree of vascularity of this tumor, especially from the external carotid system. This was subsequently embolized, as you can see here. Uh, there's a coil, and what you'll see next is the nice post-operative angiography demonstrating significantly reduced vascularity of this particular tumor. Here's another corresponding post-angiography uh, image as well. What you'll see here is we look at the nasal cavity in the right side, looking at the tumor there filling the nasal cavity as well as the right septum and inferior turbinate. And then uh, just taking an exam uh, over here on the left side as well. Uh, the septum is bowed towards the left side, but does not necessarily extend towards that side. In this particular case, uh, what we began to do is work on the left side. Uh, this is mainly to facilitate access. So here we are trimming the middle turbine after opening up the left maxillary sinus, and then go ahead and open up the uh, left sphenoid sinus as well. In this case, uh, we did elect to raise a nasal septal flap on the contralateral side, as we had a uh, suspicion that we would at least expose dura, if not cause a CSF leak in this particular case. So here we are uh, raising that flap up front in order to facilitate access by completing a posterior septectomy, which allows us a significant better uh, bilateral uh, access to this particular tumor. One of the reasons to open up the left side maxillary sinus in this case is that once this flap is raised, we can then tuck it into that left maxillary sinus and keep it out of the way during the case, as opposed to most transfernal surgeries where we'll tuck it into the nasopharynx. Of course, in this particular case, the nasopharynx is not a great place to put your flap, as you need that area to uh, perform your tumor dissection. So here's this flap being raised from anterior to posterior, once again on the left side. Then we're gonna begin to uh, access uh, the posterior aspect of the nasal cavity by completing a uh, posterior septectomy to facilitate that binostral access. And once the flap is fully raised, we'll tuck it into the left maxillary sinus, as you can see here, to keep it out of the way throughout the case. Now here we are on the right side. Now at this point, uh, we had a high degree of suspicion for this being a JNA, uh, but did not have pathologic diagnosis yet. So here we are opening up the right maxillary sinus, just in the axilla of the middle turbinate there, uh, to once again facilitate our access here, as we know we need to get laterally uh, into the pterygopalatine fossa as well. Prior to accessing the tumor and getting significant bleeding, we'll do some of this sinus work up front uh, in order to facilitate our access, but yet not get into significant tumor bleeding at this juncture. We had a very nice angiography and embolization, but of course there's always a chance you get tumor bleeding. Once some of that sinus work is done, we'll then go ahead and use a needle tip bobby cautery to remove a portion of this anterior tumor and send it off for frozen section pathology to confirm diagnosis. Although this tumor has a classic appearance of a JNA, I do typically like to get pathologic diagnosis intraoperatively to confirm it. Uh, there have been cases, uh, including one that I had to take care of, uh, where patients were taken care of outside uh, facilities, it assumed to be a JNA, and then it came back as a different malignancy and needed simply more surgery afterwards. So here we are taking some additional biopsies of the tumor for permanent pathology. As you can see, we're, we're reassured that there's not significant tumor bleeding as our preoperative embolization was excellent. And then what I like to do in these cases is uh, debulk some of the tumor and get access to the sinuses around it, and quickly we'll establish a nasopharyngeal port as well for egress of blood. Here we are working above the tumor, uh, once again doing some of our more posterior sinus work in order to facilitate our uh, instrumentation and access, and then begin to debulk the tumor as it hangs in the nasal cavity. As with most sinonasal tumors, we like to do this by a debulking technique uh, where the tumor is not attached to remove the bulk of the tumor within the nasal cavity, and again, allow egress of blood 
towards the nasopharynx, which is really important for vascular tumors to improve visualization. Here we are with a microdebrider uh, trimming the most inferior aspect of the tumor. Uh, these have a very firm fibrous stroma, and sometimes the microdebrider is not quite effective enough for them, and you may need to use uh, through cut instrumentation or other instrumentation. But in this particular case, although the tumor was fairly fibrous, the microdebrider was able to remove it in a piecemeal fashion. As you can see here, we're using a cautery device uh, that has a nice sort of plasma field, if you will, and that allows us to uh, sequentially cauterize the tumor as you work around it. Here we are in the remaining portion of the right posterior septum. Again, what you'll note is we've raised a previous contralateral septal flap, such that the pedicle in the flap is not damaged during this part of the dissection, We're then accessing that posterior septum and coming across midline. Here we're moving the most inferior portion of the nasal septum below the tumor, uh, allowing uh, a better uh, port for egress of blood as well as for access of the tumor. At this juncture, we'll proceed with our right-sided endoscopic medial maxillectomy. So here we are removing that inferior turban on the right side, then taking out the entire uh, medial wall of the maxillary sinus here on the right side down to the nasal cavity floor. And now what you'll see is we're visualizing into the right maxillary sinus and looking posteriorly at the posterior wall towards the uh, pterygopalatine fossa. In this case, due to the extent of the tumor laterally into the infratemporal fossa, as well as uh, eroding the middle cranial fossa, we elected to combine this with an ipsilateral transmaxillary or caldwell luck approach. The most important thing when you make this initial mucosal incision is to uh, leave yourself enough mucosa on the buccal surface in order to suture to postoperatively. Here we are incising through muscle uh, down to the face of the maxilla, and then exposing uh, the periosteum in the bone itself. We'll uh, work uh, superiorly through here, then open up into the maxillary sinus with a drill and a kerosene above the tooth roots and below uh, the infraorbital nerve. This allows us better lateral access uh, here in the infratemporal fossa. So here we are taking down the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus through that Caldwell Luck approach, getting out towards the infratemporal fossa, as you can see here. What you'll notice is that we uh, did our best to leave the periosteum of the pterygopalatine fossa intact, which facilitates a lack of bleeding as well as keeping the fat in place so it's not spilling out into your field. This also allows us to work through a combined approach, both endoscopically through the nose, as well as through that Caldwell Luck to get that lateral exposure. Here we are isolating the nasal cavity portion of the tumor, uh, where it originates from in the sphenotalatine foramen in the infratemporal fossa. And we'll go ahead and incise the periosteum of the pterygopalatine fossa. The pterygopalatine fossa is, of course, where uh, the vast majority of these tumors arise from, getting their primary blood supply from the sphenopalatine artery, which is a branch of the terminal branch of the external carotid, uh, which is the internal maxillary artery. And we will sequentially dissect and remove this tumor again. Uh, right now, the camera is through the Caldwell lock, and our instrumentation is through the nasal cavity. And here we are coagulating some of that tumor as we work through this pterygopalatine fossa uh, laterally towards the infratemporal fossa. It should be noted that occasionally these tumors will have direct blood supply from the internal carotid artery. When this occurs, it's typically from a uh, portion of the vidian artery, the nerve, or the artery of the pterygoid canal. Here we are now uh, better exposing uh, the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone. As you guys are aware, that, that contributes to both the medial and lateral pterygoid plates, as well as the pterygoid body, or as we like to refer to it as the pterygoid wedge. More inferiorly in that particular area, you'll see the uh, palatine bone, in particular the uh, perpendicular plate of the palatine bone, where it forms a wall of the nasal cavity up to the sphenopalatine foramen. So here we are working through that junction of the pterygoid wedge, uh, taking additional tumor here with a uh, cautery. And now we'll begin to work a little bit back towards the uh, nasopharynx, and we'll come back to that uh, pterygopalatine fossa here in a little bit. There we are excising through uh, the sphenopalatine artery. As you can see, there's really no vascularity through it due to our excellent preoperative uh, embolization. So there we had a nice visualization of the perpendicular plate of the palatine bone as you work back towards its articulation with the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone. We're now working inferiorly in the nasopharynx, uh, coming around the tumor laterally and then inferiorly. At this juncture, we're going to come back out to the pterygopalatine fossa. We've better isolated the residual tumor here. Working again through the combined uh, right side of Caldwell Luck and endonasal approach, dissecting out additional tumor here amongst the fat of the pterygopalatine fossa. And here we are out lateral to the infratemporal fossa, identifying that internal maxillary artery and in working through that.
Although this has been well embolized, I do typically in most cases like to put a clip or cauterize this to ensure there's no residual bleeding uh, postoperatively. So here we're isolating that artery, uh, pulling it from the infratemporal fossa into the pterygopalatine fossa through our combined approach and placing them clips across it. Then we'll transect that and remove the last portion of tumor uh, within the pterygopalatine fossa. For added measure, we're coagulating that with a bipolar cautery. And then we'll work through that uh, artery uh, and then dissect that tumor from the infratemporal fossa and PPF in towards the nasal cavity. So here are just lateral to the last portion of tumor, uh, trimming that and then removing that portion. And as we all hate to get postoperative epistaxis, which could be life threatening in this case, we'll put a few extra clips and cautery on that particular artery, which again um, has been previously embolized. We're now working above the tumor. Uh, we're in the right sphenoid sinus, as you can see here. Uh, the base of the sphenoid sinus is one of the more common sites of recurrence of this. That's a certainly important area to dissect, and as you'll see here in a little while, we'll drill that down uh, to ensure no residual tumor is there. Just behind the tumor, you can see nicely uh, the optical carotid recess. And here we are removing the, that uh, bulk of the tumor there in the right sphenoid sinus. In this case, the tumor does cross midline into the left sphenoid sinus as well. And here we are trimming the uh, tumor off that base of the left sphenoid sinus. As you can see here, the tumor is not really attached in the left sphenoid, but simply has uh, infiltrated that area. There's the inner sinus septation, but it does have some attachment there in the base of both the right and left sphenoid sinuses. If you're going to get bleeding from the internal carotid system, it can either come directly from the lacerum segment or through the vidian artery, as I mentioned earlier. If that blood supply would be present, it'd be right around here on the right side. We're right in the uh, region of the right vidian nerve. Now we are dissecting uh, laterally within the junction of that right sphenoid sinus, then working out uh, a bit further laterally towards the uh, middle cranial fossa on that right side. At this junction, we're going to work further laterally along the portion that has eroded along that uh, right middle cranial fossa. We're going to begin to drill down here uh, additional uh, portions of the pterygoid wedge or pterygoid body as well as the uh, medial pterygoid plate, and then work just above here in this particular region. The most important landmarks as we work through here are going to be uh, your V2 through foramen rotundum, and then as I mentioned earlier, that vidian uh, nerve as well. And here we are taking out additional tumor as it extends laterally, as you saw in the preoperative axial MRI scan along that uh, right middle cranial fossa. We always like to uh, drill bone anteriorly that uh, is able to be removed in order to facilitate our full access to this area and excellent visualization. A bit of additional uh, anterior bone there being removed. Again, that's right along the uh, pterygoid body or pterygoid wedge and uh, just above the junction of the perpendicular plate of the palatine bone. Bone work is very important in these tumors as tumor can infiltrate the bone. We've come back now almost to the junction of the clivus, drilling down the sphenoid floor and following the vidian nerve uh, posteriorly and removing all of that diseased bone as it uh, progresses posteriorly along the sphenoid floor towards uh, the clivus. We're now just below there on the nasopharynx and again working a little bit further laterally here as well. We're in the neighborhood of the lacerum segment of the carotid artery, so certainly we'll intermittently use Doppler there to Doppler that out. Then as you can see here in the, on that coronal uh, post-GAD T1 MRI scan, this is that last bit of tumor, the most farther lateral extent below the middle cranial fossa uh, and just behind the uh, infratemporal fossa. And here's the last bit of tumor uh, being pulled out uh, along that particular area, that most uh, farthest lateral extent there. And then what you'll see is uh, just a little bit of uh, exposed dura just above uh, us there. Now again, we'll begin to work inferiorly here. So we've taken care of the portion of the tumor along the middle cranial fossa, in the sphenoid, as well as laterally in the infratemporal fossa and pterygopalatine fossa. We'll now drill down some bone along the junction of the uh, sphenoid floor and uh, the clivus. Once that's been completed, we've elected to put a little bit of abdominal fat here into that uh, portion of the exposed dura along the middle cranial fossa. There is no CSF leak in this particular case, but again, to cover that exposed dura and area along the middle cranial fossa. We'll take our left-sided nasal septal flap and bring that across midline to cover that area where we put the fat graft in uh, right along the uh, middle cranial fossa. Once that has been completed, we'll place some packing material. Here is some uh, oxidized cellulose being placed along the flap followed by some gel foam.
we'll put some uh, resorbable, uh, longer lasting nasal packing in as well. And in this case, we've placed doyle splints as well. And here is an image of a, a three month post operative MRI scan uh, demonstrating the surgical resection as well as some evolving post operative changes and no evidence of residual tumor. The first key point is that taking care of JNA patients is a team based sport. Certainly, I always do these with my neurosurgical colleagues. Uh, and of course, neurointerventional radiologists are extremely important uh, for preoperative angiography and embolization. Tumor access is also key. As you assess the vascularity of these tumors after the embolization, you must prepare for whatever approach is needed. In some cases, these are all done endonasally. Certainly, as we showed in this video, occasional uh, transmaxillary approach is needed. And although quite rare, occasionally open approaches or craniotomies may also be necessary. And lastly, a key point for these tumors is if you have a young male in clinic with a vascular appearing tumor, there is certainly a high chance it could be a JNA, and this is a tumor that you do not want to biopsy in clinic as you will have an uncontrolled hemorrhage on your hands.